Well, we are continuing the series that we've titled Vision, and here is the album for all four CDs this month. We'll do our last CD next month, and if you choose to pre-order this series in the Tree of Life bookstore, then you will also receive a free bonus DVD where you're going to learn more about God's vision for your life so you can pre-order, and then they will be available for you after the service next month. Sunday. We are ministering on the series called Vision, and our text scripture is found in the very first part of Proverbs 29, 18. The King James Version says, where there is no vision, the people perish. The New Living Translation says, where there is no vision, I'm sorry, when people do not accept divine guidance, they run wild. And then there's a Spanish translation that says, where there is no progressive vision, the people run around like wild, untamed horses. Our first message was, God has a plan for your life. You have to understand that life is to be lived on purpose. It's to be lived with God's vision God's plans for your life. Until you know God's purpose and vision for your life, then you're going to be running around like a wild, untamed horse. But when you gain insight from His Word about His vision and His plan for your life and begin to live out this journey that God has you on, then your life becomes an adventure in faith. It becomes exciting. It means that every morning you can't wait to wake up to see what God is going to do in and through and even for your life. And then last Sunday, we shared with you the sermon God's vision for your health. God wants your body strong. God wants your body filled with Zoe life. I don't have time to go back and review and rehearse everything, but just know that God has a vision for your bodily, physical health. Today, our sermon is titled, God's Vision for Abundance. Now, we're going to find out where you stand today. When you hear God's word on this particular subject, we're going to be able to locate your heart and your mind as to what you're believing right now about the subject of abundance. And please, when I use the term abundance, don't just think dollar signs and motor homes and boats. There's nothing wrong with any of those things, but that's way low on the totem pole of God's abundance for our lives. It doesn't begin there. I'm going to share with you a foundation this morning that is very relevant and important so that we can begin to tear down any strongholds that you may have in your mind that God is not a God of abundance, or secondly, that if He is a God of abundance, that you will never be able to participate in that abundance. The Bible says that God's Word is alive and powerful, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. We're going to find out today what's your thoughts and what the intents of your heart. Now, any time that I make statements like that, I say those statements because I want you to understand any time the Word comes at you, and God's Word is trying to tear down these strongholds, it's not coming with an intention of condemnation. But location. God wants you to locate where you are in your thinking and in your believing. Because if your thinking and believing do not line up with how God actually is and who He is and what He's done, then you repent. And the word repent in the Greek text just means Change your mind, metanoia, change your mind. And so that's what we're doing in these church services. We have people repenting every single church service by just hearing the truth, and they change their mind from the way they used to think to a new thinking based upon God's Word. Can I have an amen? Revelation 1, beginning of verse 10. This is John the Revelator, and he writes, 
And he, that's Jesus, carried me, John, the Apostle John, away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain. And he showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Having the glory of God, her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Also, she had a great and high wall with twelve gates, twelve angels at the gates, and names written on them, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel." Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. Now the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And he who talked with me, I love this, he had a gold reed to measure the city, not some steel measuring stick that we measure with today. No, God measures with gold its gates, and its wall. The city is laid out as a square, four square. Its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, this gold reed. 12,000 furlongs, its length, breadth, and height are equal. Then he measured its wall, 144 cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of an angel. A cubit is from your elbow to the tip of your longest finger. The construction of its wall, listen now, get this picture in your head right now. The construction of its wall was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like clear glass. You've never seen gold like that. It's like clear glass. It's 100% gold. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds, ladies, of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper. The second, sapphire. Paulette loves black sapphires. I bought her a bunch of them. The third, chalcedony. The fourth, and this is one of my favorite ones, Emerald. I love emeralds. I think they're gorgeous. The fifth, sardonyx. The sixth, sardius. The seventh, chrysolite. The eighth, beryl. The ninth, topaz. The tenth, chrysoprase. The eleventh, jacinth. And the twelfth, amethyst. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the shine that comes off? Of these precious jewels? Notice what he says in verse 21. The twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each individual gate was of one pearl. Can you imagine the size of that oyster? Woo! And the street of the city again was pure gold like transparent glass. Now, the reason I share these thoughts with you from Scripture is because God wants you to understand He does not live in squalor. He does not live in a broken down shack. Heaven has no lack or poverty within it. That this city called the New Jerusalem is filled with precious stones, translucent gold, that I want you to have this picture, this image inside you, that God has nothing to do with lack and poverty. That God, when you read these verses and other verses throughout the Word of God, God is very opulent. He is. He's, he's extravagant. When you go back into the Old Testament, which I've been reading in my daily Bible reading over in Chronicles of late, and you read about... Solomon's temple. My gosh, if you built a church building in the Permian Basin like Solomon's temple, we would be on the headlines of the newspaper every day of all the thieves we are. Because the opulence that was in Solomon's temple, the house that was built for the Lord. I mean, the wealth that was placed in that edifice, that facility. God is a God of abundance. 
And that God is not a God of just squeaking by, just getting by by the skin of your teeth. He's a God of abundance in every area of life. And then we see in Luke's Gospel, chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, that as the multitude pressed about Jesus to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats standing by the lake. But the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. You have to understand that these men who were in the fishing business, they fished all night long. That's how they fished. Because in the Lake of Galilee, the fish did not bite during the day. They bit during the night. And so it was a long, laborious night for these fishermen because they caught nothing. And now, at dawn, they're on shore, and they are now washing their nets. And again, to understand that day and age, washing their nets was not just a 20-minute exercise of labor. It took hours. They were filthy. They were huge nets. And so it took them hours. Once again, it was a back-breaking, euphemistically, dirty, hard job to clean these nets. And so they were washing their nets in verse 3. Then Jesus got into one of the boats, which was Simon's. That's Peter. He was not yet Peter. He had not yet been named Peter. He was not yet a disciple of Jesus. And so Jesus asked him to put out a little from the land. He asked for his boat, the use of his boat. And then Jesus sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. And when he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, Look what he said to him. Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Here's the inference. Anytime we see in the written word or anytime the Holy Spirit speaks to us individually for something he wants from us, he always has increase, multiplication, harvest on his mind for you. Anytime you see in the Word where God is asking something from you or He individually speaks into your spirit for something from you, He always has harvest that will multiply on His mind for your life. And when Jesus asked for this boat, He had harvest on His mind for Simon. He said, let down your nets, plural, for a catch, verse 5. But Simon answered and said, notice Simon here is in the flesh. He's thinking naturally. He's thinking about the back-breaking job he's had for these last several hours in the early morning to clean these nets, also understanding that they toiled all night and they caught nothing. He said, Master, we've toiled all night. In other words, hey, you preacher, we fishermen. You preach, we fish. We don't tell you how to preach. Don't tell us how to catch the fish. He said, Master, we've toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I want to test you here. I'll let down the net. Not the net. Jesus said, let down the nets. I'll test you. I'll test you. I'll let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. God is a God of abundance. He is not a God that just wants people to get by in life. Just to have this mentality of always behind, never ahead. I'm not talking just financially. I'm going to be talking about every area of your life, spiritually, physically, intellectually, emotionally, relationally, socially, maritally, financially. Every area. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that even as they filled both the boats, they began to sink. Why? Because God is El Shaddai God. El Shaddai means the God who is more than enough. The all-sufficient one, literally the all-breasty one. The picture in the Hebrew is of a baby nursing from the breast of her mother where she retains and 
she receives all the sustenance, everything and more she will need for the day or for the time. God is the all-sufficient one. He's the all-sufficient one. Let me show you another story that's true. In John 6, beginning in verse 5, Jesus lifted up his eyes and he saw a great multitude coming towards him. And he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test and prove him, for he, Jesus himself, knew what he was going to do. And so Philip answered in the flesh, carnally. He answered, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may have a little. That every one of them may have a little. That every one, this is how people think. That every one of them may have a little. And one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? Then Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. Let me stop for a moment. The reason Scripture tells us that the number was about 5,000 men, because in this day and age, families were identified by the man, the husband. And so they would say 5,000 men represent 5,000 families. And the average number of children to the Jewish family in this day and age, four children. So you're talking about somewhere between 20 and 30,000 people were the makeup of this multitude. That's a lot of people to feed with five barley loaves and two small fish. And Jesus took the loaves. And when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples. This is a key principle for Christians' lives right here. This is why many Christians today struggle. This is why many Christians are stressed out and why they are frustrated. Because they have their own plans and they ask God to bless them. And God won't bless our own plans. God blesses His plans and His vision for our lives. And God gives us a way to prosper in every area of our lives. But for anything to prosper in the Christian's life, it has to be blessed. Here Jesus, first of all, took the loaves and the fish, and He first of all blessed them. Anything that Jesus blessed is going to prosper. Anything that He doesn't bless, you're on your own. He loves you, but you're on your own. And that's where the sweat comes in. That's where the, the, the self-effort and the self-performance of Christians comes into play. And this is why we come up short all the time. Because we're trying to get Him to bless our plans. And He's not going to do it. You get His plans. You get His vision. That's why that was the first sermon in these series of teachings. You get His vision. You get His plans for your life. And life will be what life is supposed to be. The journey will be filled with multiplication and abundance. And so he gave thanks with these five barley loaves and two small fish. And then notice, he distributed them to the disciples. In other words, the miracle did not play, take place in the hands of Jesus. They did not. They, the miracle of the multiplication of the loaves and the fish did not take place until Jesus put them in the hands of the disciples. That's a type of exactly what I just said to you. When what we have in our hands comes from Jesus, it will be blessed, and then Jesus wants to put everything that's blessed into our hands so it can multiply. And it's not going to multiply until it's blessed and gets into our hands. And once it's blessed by Jesus and gets into our hands, then multiplication takes place. That's how we're supposed to live our lives. I've told you many, many times, in fact, it's on the Voice of Faith this weekend. I don't live by my head. I think with my head. I live by my heart. Because when you live by your heart, what you get are dreams and visions. 
When you're living your life with God's dreams and visions that come from your heart, life is exciting. Life is phenomenal. Doesn't mean you don't have challenges, but life is super, super exciting when you're living from your heart. Now look at verse 11. So he took, again, verse 11. He took the loaves, he gave thanks, he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples to those sitting down. The miracle took place through the hands of the disciples. And notice the last part. And likewise of the fish, as much as they wanted. Not a little. As much as they wanted. This is how God operates in His kingdom. Not just for Himself, but for His children. As much as they wanted. They could have as much. See, we have this men mentality that a little bit is enough. That's not God's mentality. God's mentality is to take as much as you want. If you're a business owner, how much do you want in your business? How big do you want your business to be? God wants it bigger than what you can ask, think, or dream. Because He wants to use you to help fund His kingdom right here in the earth. Whatever your career is, how good do you want to be in your career? Do you want to stay average with the rest of the pack? Or do you want to exceed? Do you want to excel? Do you want to be better than the pack? God wants you to be the best you can be through Him. He wants you to have more than enough. He wants you to have a mentality. It's out there for the taking. But you have to think right. You have to believe right. You can't believe it's going to come just through back-breaking, net-cleaning, hard work. Thank God for hard work. I believe in hard work. It all begins by believing. Believing that God is a God of abundance. That He wants you to enjoy the abundant lifestyle. It's what He wants. He didn't come to give you a puny life. He didn't come to give you a just barely get by life. Just to squeeze and to eke into heaven. That's not the kind of life He came to give you. They took as much as they wanted. And notice Jesus didn't rebuke them for that. Verse 12, so when they were filled, He said to His disciples, gather up the fragments that remain. Why? Jesus is not wasteful. So that nothing is lost. Therefore they gathered them up and they filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the, 12, of the five barley loaves which were left over by those who had eaten. In other words, 12 here. In other words, Jesus wanted to give each disciple a doggy bag. Come on, somebody. No, not really. He's going to give it back to the little kid. But that's just a good little joke you need to have there. Laugh at the pastor's jokes. Amen. All right. You know my favorite verse in this church. John 10.10. 10. New King James, the thief, Jesus said, does not come except to steal, to kill, to destroy I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. The last part of that verse from the Amplified. I came that they may have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. The Common English Bible. I came so that they could have life indeed so that they could live life to the fullest. The easy-to-read version, but I came to give life, life that is full and good. The New Living Translation, my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. I mean, it doesn't take a, a spiritual giant to figure out why this is my favorite verse. This is the verse that I draw a line for every area of my life. If it's bad, it's the devil. I don't attribute anything of the devil to God. But if it's good, it's God. And I give Him praise for it. And I use this verse. It's so simple. You do not have to have even a third grade education to figure that out. If it's good from this verse, it's God. If it's bad, it's the devil. And Jesus came to give us more of a life than the enemy could ever steal from us. 3 John 2. The Darby translation, John said, Beloved, I desire that in all things that thou should prosper and be in health, even as 
your soul prosperous. Let me just begin with the first word there. You have to understand that you're God's beloved. We understand that when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist in the River Jordan, when he came up out of the water after being baptized, a voice from the Father came and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And so Jesus immediately was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to fast and pray for 40 days and nights. At the conclusion of that time of fasting and prayer, the devil came to him. And the first thing he said to him is, if you be the Son of God. What do you think the devil's out after? First and foremost, he is out to steal from you your identity. He wants you to have an identity of just you in your blackness or your brownness or your whiteness or your redness or your yellowish. He wants you to be totally caught up in the color of your skin and your people. Come on now. I'm telling you the truth. God wants you to have an understanding of your true identity, which is that you are a new creation in Christ. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That greater is He who is in you than he that's in the world. That He who knew no sin was made to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. That's your true identity. You're in Christ. You have right standing with the Father. You've been approved of and accepted by the Father. That's who you are. You're a beloved. You're beloved in Christ of the Father. You're the apple of His eye. And so you have to know your life. Why does God want to share His abundance with His children? First and foremost, because He loves you. The same way... As a father or a grandfather, if you passed and go on to be with Jesus, what are you going to do? You're going to leave a will, and in that will, you're going to leave everything that you've accumulated to your children and your grandchildren. Why? Because you love them. Because you love them. And you don't mind taking everything that you worked for all your life that still is left over when you pass and to give it to them as an inheritance. How much more does our Heavenly Father love us and want to share His inheritance with us today? Everything that Jesus inherited, the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, is ours. Beloved, I desire that in all things you should prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. I'll close the lesson in just a few moments with the last part, even as your soul prospers. But notice, it's this desire that you prosper, that you be in health. We dealt with the health last week. It all begins with spiritual prosperity. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, the Bible says, In Him, in Christ, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, listen, according to the riches of His grace. Not just His grace, but the riches. When you study the Word of God, you'll find, look up, get your concordance, and look up the word abundance, look up the word rich and riches, and you're going to find these words sprinkled throughout the entire Bible. The riches of His grace, the riches of His unmerited, unearned, undeserved favor. God never runs out of His favor for your life. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 and 5, But God, who is rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, He made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. Grace is God giving us what we don't deserve. Mercy is God not giving us what we deserve. And God never runs out of His grace. He never runs out of His mercy. In fact, Lamentations chapter 3 says that God's mercies are new every single morning. I've got to admit, I know there's been days in my life where I've used up all the mercies of God for my day, and at 12.01, I needed some new mercies. I knew I did, and I still know I do. God's rich. 
He's rich in these spiritual applications of what's most important. Look at Ephesians 3.20. He says, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Listen to the Amplified. Now to him who by in consequence of the action of his power that is at work within us is able to carry out his purpose and do super abundantly. Say super abundantly. Doesn't it just feel good coming off your tongue? Say it again. Far over and above all that we dare ask or think infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, hopes, or dreams. That's why I said to you a moment ago, don't live by your head. Renew your mind. Don't live by your head. Live by your heart. Because in your heart is where God puts dreams. Is where God puts your future. Where he puts the hope that he has for your life, the plans that he has for your life. And I love the Amplified here. He says, to carry out his purpose and do it super abundantly, far over and above all that we dare ask or think. You know, when I was a kid, I don't know about kids today, but when I was a kid, there would always be someone who would present you with a dare. I dare you to do this. I dare you to jump over there. I dare you to do this or that. And sometimes we'd take the dare, and sometimes we'd say, ah, I think I'll pass. But then if we said, ah, I don't think I'm going to do that, then sometimes they would come back and say, I double dog dare you. I double dog dare you. And when someone double dog dares you, you got to do it. You got to do it. I mean, even if it, mean, if it means jumping off the roof of your house to prove that you can do it because you got your daddy's big robe on and you think by flapping that big robe you're going to be able to fly off that roof, if you're double dog there, you're going to do it. Somebody talk to me. I believe God is double dog daring us. That He wants us to begin to ask, to think beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, hopes, or dreams. Let the language of the Holy Spirit, which is the language of hopes and dreams and prayers within you, let Him begin to dream through you. Learn to pick up on what's coming from your heart. God is not scared, fearful, one iota when you begin to dream big dreams. When you want to take over your firm. When you start at the very bottom of McDonald's, but you have a goal one day that not only are you going to move up and own that McDonald's, you're going to own 10 or 15 of them. See, that's the kind of dreaming that God puts in people's hearts. And that's why average is not within God's realm. It's not within God's kingdom. Ordinary. In the flesh, we're all ordinary. All of us are. But we're no longer in the flesh. Romans 8 says when you're born again, you're now in the Spirit. In Ephesians 1.3, to carry out what we just saw there in Ephesians 3.20, Ephesians 1.3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And so everything you and I will ever need has already been deposited in your born-again spirit. All the favor of God, all the wisdom of God, all the intellect of God, all the strength of God, all the favor of God, all the blessing of God, everything you will ever need in your life in this journey called life has already been deposited within your born-again spirit. You have to learn how to make a demand on what's inside of you, to live by the inside of you. The dreams, the visions, the hopes, the aspirations. That's what God wants you to learn to live by. That's the language of the Holy Spirit. That's what this church is about. God interrupted a businessman in the school teacher's life because he desired to build a supernatural church in Odessa, Texas. 
out here on the highway to say to people that you're loved, that you're forgiven, that you're righteous, that you're blessed, that you're favored, that God is a miracle-working God, that God is a healing God, that God wants you to take everything He's invested in you, and He wants you to become a carbon copy of Himself on this earth, to not accept average, to not accept ordinary, to rise to a newer level. This is a supernatural church. It's being built supernaturally, not by Don and Paul at Kwood, but by God and the Holy Spirit. That's who's building this church. He's building this. He's building my life. He's building your life. I'm turned on. This is where I live, man. That's why I get turned on. Romans 5:20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. In other words, God gave the law so that we become aware of our sinfulness and our need for a Savior. Notice now, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Now, in the Greek, you would think that these two words, abounded and abound, would be the same Greek word. You know they're not. Two different Greek words. The first word, but where sin abounded, it means abounded. But then grace did much more abound. That word means superabound. That wherever darkness is in your life, wherever pain is in your life, wherever disappointment, frustration is in your life, no matter what the darkness is, no matter what the sin has been, no matter what you've been through, no matter what's been done to you, that Sin has abounded. That darkness has abounded. It has helped shape people's thoughts, their thinking. But then when you catch hold of God's vision for your life, which is inclusive, obviously, of the divine favor of God, the grace of God, God's divine favor superabounds over all that darkness, over all that disappointment, over all that frustration, over all that hurt and pain in your life, over all that abuse. God's favor, if you will allow Him, will superabound over the abounding of that pain in your life. Why? Because God is a God of abundance. He's a God of abundance. And I close with this. These last thoughts I want to share with you. Again, 3 John 2, we read it. Beloved, I desire above all things that you prosper and that you be in health even as your soul prospers. That's the key. As your soul, your mind, emotions, and will. Romans 12, 2. And do not be conformed to this world. One translation says, do not be fashioned according to the age that you live in. Don't embrace the culture. Work in the culture. Understand the culture, but don't embrace it. Understand it. Don't curse it, but become a light in the culture. Don't be conformed to the world you live in, to the world's way of thinking, but be transformed. That's the Greek word metamorpho. We get our word metamorphosis. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Again, when you're born again, you're a spirit being, so your spirit is instantly transformed. Just like, you're just like Christ on the inside. Colossians 2, 9 and 10, and 1 John 4, 17. You're just like Jesus on the inside, your spirit man, when you're born again. But you still have your body. You still have your mind, emotions, and will that are not transformed. And so he says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can prove, test, experience what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Paul said to us in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning in verse 3, he said, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not human. But they are mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds. Casting down imaginations, vain imaginations. 
and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into the obedience of Christ. So he defines strongholds as dominant thought patterns. Some of you watching me today and many of you here today, you grew up, by your parents, guardians, grandparents, family members, coaches, teachers, Sunday school teachers, next door neighbors, drawing a line between the rich folk and you. And so many of you grew up thinking that you could never be like them. It's a stronghold in your life because that's how you think. Because it was ingrained into your mind from a toddler. That's them. We is us. And so Pastor Don is raised up by the Lord Jesus Christ supernaturally to teach you the abundant lifestyle in Christ. To teach you that as I taught in the tithe teaching today, God is not necessarily trying to get something from you. He's trying to get something to you. But there's principles that have to be adhered to and followed. Believed first and followed. And until we begin to allow our mind to, and that's why I gave you the foundation from Revelation, from Luke, and from John. To show you that God is a God of abundance. In every area of life. Spiritually. Mentally. Emotionally. Willfully. Physically. Relationally. Socially. Financially. Maritally. God has the abundant lifestyle for everyone. But the reason that most Christians don't buy into it is because of that stronghold. It's in their mind. You see, I grew up, I've told you before, I'm just about out of time. I grew up low middle class until we got, until about my seventh, eighth grade year, we became middle class. We didn't live very good as low middle class people. Now, my parents loved me, they did the best job they could. But from a child, I hated poverty, I despised it. I'm talking six, seven, eight years old. I saw it, and I hated it. I believe God put it in my heart at that age. I do believe with all my heart. And I decided when I was a young, young boy, I, I don't want my life to be like this. I don't want to be average. That's before Christ came into my life. I was doing everything I could, I could to fight my way out of that thinking. That's why I went to college. That's why I went to Chicago, my first job out of college. I, I didn't want to stay around all the average people doing average things. And then God got a hold of my life, and God superinfused me with His Spirit and with knowledge of who God really is, that He really does love me, and that God's not out to hurt me as I was taught. That God is not out to punish me. That God is not out to condemn me and judge me all the time as His child. I, my thinking changed when I was born again and got in church that taught me the truth. And all that from a child started coming back into my life. How much I hated lack. How much I saw my parents struggle. I saw it. And I hated it. I saw how in the fifth grade my mom had to go to work making minimum age for the, a minimum wage for the next so many years of her life till she died. And she's taken away from being a homemaker, which she loved with her children. I saw what it did. And I'm here to tell you today, that's not God's will for our lives today in the 21st century. God wants you to enjoy the abundant life in every area, but he begins by believing it. And I close with Philemon, verse 6. Philemon is one chapter. Philemon says that the communication of your faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ. You have to start acknowledging what you have in Christ. See, confession does not bring God on the scene. Confession builds your awareness 
and a new image inside of you to start destroying those strongholds in your life. I, I say, I'll, I'll close here with this one. I pray, I love to pray. Pauline will tell you, I love to pray. I enjoy prayer. It's a, it's a passion of mine. It wasn't many years ago, but I love to pray now. And much of, most of my prayer is in the Spirit, but when I pray in my known language, most of my prayer in my known language is just agreeing with God. Father, I thank you that today's a great day because this is the day that you have made, and I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. Father, I thank you that I am a new creation in Christ, that old things have passed away in my life, and all things have become new. Father, I thank you in my life today, greater is he who is in me than he that is in the world. Father, I thank you that I can do all things through Christ today who strengthens me. Father, I thank you today that I am more than a conqueror through Christ who loves me. Heavenly Father, I thank you that I don't have a spirit of fear, intimidation, or timidity, but power, love, and a sound mind. Father, I thank you that you have made me the head and not the tail above, only and not beneath. I am blessed in the city and the field coming in and going out. Whatever I set my hand to is going to prosper. Father, I thank you that you have spoken blessing on my storehouses. Father, I thank you my marriage is blessed. I thank you my wife is pretty She's blessed. I thank you, Lord, that she has the oracles of God in her mouth. I thank you, my wife is healed. See, I pray by agreeing with the Word of God. I pray by agreeing with the Word of God. And see, that's what changes our lives. Why? Because God's Word is alive and powerful. You start confessing the Word of God. You start confessing that you are a new believer in Christ. You start confessing that the career God has given you is the place God has you and that you're going to be the very best you can be with Christ in your life, you will start watching what God does in and through your life because you're believing Him. You're not putting your trust in your talent. You're not putting your trust in your ability. You're putting your trust in Christ within you. You're acknowledging what's inside you. And as you do that, God's going to prosper you. Why? He is the God of abundance. Give Him praise today. I'm out of time. Amen. <laughs> I tell you, folks, this stuff is good. This church has entered into a new dynamic. This church has entered into a newer realm than ever before. And as you're a part of it, you can expect the same for your life. Father, I thank you for your word today. I, I pray that your word, Lord, is sealed into our hearts and minds, never to be stolen from us. I pray, Lord, that we will think on, meditate what we have heard today, and that, Father, as a result from Joshua 1.8, you said we'll make our way prosperous and we'll have good success. We'll deal wisely in all the affairs of life. I commend every person, Lord, to you and to the word of your grace, which is able to build us up and to give us our inheritance among them that are sanctified in Jesus' name. If you're here today and you've never invited Jesus into your life,